Hello, hello, and welcome to Fall Walk 28. I'm going to start off strong here and begin our workout on Map My Walk so we can log our stats and make sure that we're logging everything correctly into the challenge hound for this month's challenge. Okay, so walk and begin. All right, so Fall Walk 28. In today's walk, we're gonna start backwards, whereas usually I start talking about my normal day, followed by today's reading, which would be chapter three of Atomic Habits. Today, we're actually gonna start with first reading Atomic Habits, chapter three, and then we'll start talking a little bit about how my day went. So earlier today, well, actually, I do have to preface by saying one more thing. Earlier today, I did manage to get a walk at lunch, 1.46 miles. So we'll do a quick calculation. So 3.23 minus 1.46, 1.77. So let's go ahead and do a 1.8 mile walk to account for the 3.23 miles I have to do daily to achieve my 100 miles by the end of December, by the end of this month to start 2024 strong. Okay, so let me do a quick camera check too. Everything looks good. We're gonna open up the book atomic habits and the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go over the chapter summary of chapter two so again let me read you the title of chapter two here how your habits shape your identity and vice versa let me skip to the bottom here let me also put my phone on low power mode to make sure i have enough battery okay so chapter summary there are three levels of change, outcome change, process change, and identity change. The most effective way to change your habits is to focus not on what you want to achieve, but on who you wish to become. Your identity emerges out of your habits. Every action is a vote for the type of person you wish to become. Becoming the best version of yourself requires you to continuously edit your beliefs and to upgrade and expand your identity. The real reason habits matter is not because they can get you better results, although they can do that, but because they can change your beliefs about yourself. So I want you all to internalize that summary. Think about yesterday's reading. If you have yet to watch any of the previous walks, I would highly encourage you to do so. That way you can listen to chapter one and also chapter two of the book and start to think a little bit about how you want to improve yourself over the next weeks, months, years, so on and so forth. And without further ado, we're going to jump right into chapter three. This one is called How to Build Better Habits in Four Simple Steps. So I love chapters like this. I love books that are very actionable and very proactive. This book is one of those books. It's easy to digest information in small tidbits. So it's just easy for anyone to read and gain something from. All right, I'm gonna wait for this bus to pass. That way you all can hear me better. And I'll wait for both cars to pass. I see a car behind. Need to be safe out here while we're walking. And here we go. So it begins. In 1898, a psychologist named Edward Thorndike conducted an experiment that would lay the foundation for our understanding of how habits form and the rules that guide our behavior. Thorndike was interested in studying the behavior of animals and he started by working with cats. He would place each cat inside a device known as a puzzle box. The box was designed so that the cat could escape through a door by some simple act, such as pulling at a loop of cord, pressing a lever, or stepping on a platform. For example, one box contained a lever that when pressed would open a door in the side of the box. Once the door had been opened, the cat could dart out and run over to a bowl of food. Most cats wanted to escape as soon as they were placed inside the box. They would poke their nose into the corners, stick their paws through openings, and claw at loose objects. After a few minutes of exploration, the cats would happen to press the magical lever, the door would open, and they would escape. Thorndike tracked the behavior of each cat across many trials. In the beginning, the animals moved around the box at random, but as soon as the lever had been pressed and the door opened, the process of learning began. Gradually, each cat learned to associate the action of pressing the lever with the reward of escaping the box and getting to the food. After 20 to 30 trials, this behavior became so automatic and habitual that the cat could escape within a few seconds. For example, Thorndike noted, Cat 12 took the following times to perform the act, 160 seconds, 30 seconds, 
90 seconds, 60, 15, 28, 20, 30, 22, 11, 15, 20, 12, 10, 14, 10, 8, 8, 5, 10, 8, 6, 6, 7. During the first three trials, the cat escaped in an average of 1.5 minutes. During the last three trials, it escaped in an average of 6.3 seconds. With practice, each cat made fewer errors and their actions became quicker and more automatic. Rather than repeat the same mistakes, the cat began to cut straight to the solution. From his studies, Thorndike described the learning process by stating, behaviors followed by satisfying consequences tend to be repeated and those that produce unpleasant consequences are less likely to be repeated. His work provides the perfect starting point for discussing how habits form in our own lives. It also provides answers to some fundamental questions like, what are habits? And why does the brain bother building them at all? Why your brain builds habits. A habit is a behavior that has been repeated enough times to become automatic. The process of habit formation begins with trial and error. Whenever you encounter a new situation in life, your brain has to make a decision. How do I respond to this? The first time you come across a problem, you're not sure how to solve it. Like Thorndike's cat, you're just trying things out to see what works. Neurological activity in the brain is high during this period. You're carefully analyzing the situation and making conscious decisions about how to act. You're taking in tons of new information and trying to make sense of it all. The brain is busy learning the most effective course of action. Occasionally, like a cat pressing on a lever, you stumble across a solution. You're feeling anxious and you discover that going for a run calms you down. You're mentally exhausted from a long day of work and you learn that playing video games relaxes you. You're exploring, 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 and then BAM! A reward. After you stumble upon an unexpected reward, you alter your strategy for next time. Your brain immediately begins to catalog the events that preceded the reward. Wait a minute, that felt good. What did I do right before that? This is the feedback loop behind all human behavior. Try, fail, learn, try differently. With practice, the useless movements fade away and the useful actions get reinforced. That's habit forming. Whenever you face a problem repeatedly, your brain begins to automate the process of solving it. Your habits are just a series of automatic solutions that solve the problems and stresses you face regularly. As behavioral scientist Jason Herrera writes, Habits are simply reliable solutions to recurring problems in our environment. As habits are created, the level of activity in the brain decreases. You learn to lock in on the cues that predict success and tune out everything else. When a similar situation arises in the future, you know exactly what to look for. There is no longer a need to analyze every angle of a situation. Your brain skips the process of trial and error and creates a mental rule. If this, then that. These cognitive scripts can be followed automatically whenever the situation is appropriate. Now whenever you feel stressed, you get the itch to run. As soon as you walk in the door from work, you grab the video game controller. A choice that once required effort is now automatic. A habit has been created. Habits are mental shortcuts learned from experience. In a sense, a habit is just a memory of the steps you previously followed to solve a problem in the past. Whenever the conditions are right, you can draw on this memory and automatically apply the same solution. The primary reason the brain remembers the past is to better predict what will work in the future. Habit formation is incredibly useful because the conscious mind is the bottleneck of the brain. It can only pay attention to one problem at a time. As a result, your brain is always working to preserve your conscious attention for whatever task is most essential. Whenever possible, the conscious mind likes to pawn off tasks to the non-conscious mind to do automatically. This is precisely what happens when a habit is formed. Habits reduce cognitive load and free up mental capacity, so you can allocate your attention to other tasks. Despite their efficiency, some people still wonder about the benefits of habits. The argument goes like this. Will habits make my life dull? I don't want to pigeonhole myself into a lifestyle I don't enjoy. Doesn't so much routine take away the vibrancy and spontaneity of life? Hardly. Such questions set up a false dichotomy. They make you think that you have to choose between building habits and attaining freedom. In reality, the two complement each other. Habits do not restrict freedom, they create it. In fact, the people who don't have their habits handled are often the ones with the least amount of freedom. 
Without good financial habits, you will always be struggling for the next dollar. Without good health habits, you will always seem to be short on energy. Without good learning habits, you will always feel like you're behind the curve. If you're always being forced to make decisions about simple tasks, when should I work out, where do I go to write, or do I pay bills, then you have less time for freedom. It's only by making the fundamentals of life easier that you can create the mental space needed for free thinking and creativity. Conversely, when you have your habits dialed in and the basics of life are handled and done, your mind is free to focus on new challenges and master the next set of problems. Building habits in the present allows you to do more of what you want in the future. The science of how habits work. The process of building a habit can be divided into four simple steps. Cue, craving, response, and reward. Breaking it down into these fundamental parts can help us understand what a habit is, how it works, and how to improve it. Now there's a figure here that again, I'll post on the video so you can all learn from it and we can all view it together. The caption says, all habits proceed through four stages in the same order, cue, craving, response, and reward. This four step pattern is the backbone of every habit and your brain runs through these steps in the same order each time. First, there's the cue. The cue triggers your brain to initiate a behavior. It is a bit of information that predicts a reward. Our prehistoric ancestors were paying attention to cues that signaled the location of primary rewards like food, water, and sex. Today, we spend most of our time learning cues that predict secondary rewards like money and fame, power and status, praise and approval, love and friendship, or a sense of personal satisfaction. Of course, these pursuits also indirectly improve our odds of survival and reproduction, which is the deeper motive behind everything we do. Your mind is continuously analyzing your internal and external environment for hints of where rewards are located. Because the cue is the first indication that we're close to a reward, it naturally leads to a craving. Cravings are the second step, and they are the motivational force behind every habit. Without some level of motivation or desire, without craving a change, we have no reason to act. What you crave is not the habit itself, but the change in state it delivers. You do not crave smoking a cigarette, you crave the feeling of relief it provides. You are not motivated by brushing your teeth, but rather by the feeling of a clean mouth. You do not want to turn on the television, you want to be entertained. Every craving is linked to a desire to change your internal state. This is an important point that we will discuss in detail later. Cravings differ from person to person. In theory, any piece of information could trigger a craving, but in practice, people are not motivated by the same cues. For a gambler, the sound of slot machines can be a potent trigger that sparks an intense wave of desire. For someone who rarely gambles, the jingles and chimes of the casino are just background noise. Cues are meaningless until they are interpreted. The thoughts, feelings, and emotions of the observer are what transform a cue into a craving. The third step is the response. The response is the actual habit you perform, which can take the form of a thought or an action. Whether a response occurs depends on how motivated you are and how much friction is associated with the behavior. If a particular action requires more physical or mental effort than you're willing to expend, then you won't do it. Your response also depends on your ability. It sounds simple, but a habit can occur only if you're capable of doing it. If you want to dunk a basketball, but you can't jump high enough to reach the hoop, well, you're out of luck. <laughs> Finally, the response delivers a reward. Rewards are the end goal of every habit. The cue is about noticing the reward. The craving is about wanting the reward. The response is about obtaining the reward. We chase rewards because they serve two purposes. They satisfy us and they teach us. The first purpose of rewards is to satisfy your craving. Yes, rewards provide benefits on their own. Food and water deliver the energy you need to survive. Getting a promotion brings more money and respect. Getting in shape improves your health and your dating prospects. But the more immediate benefit is that rewards satisfy your cravings to eat or to gain status or to win approval. At least for a moment, rewards deliver contentment and relief from craving. Second, rewards teach us which actions are worth remembering in the future. Your brain is a reward detector. As you go about your life, your sensory nervous system is continuously monitoring which actions satisfy your desires and deliver pleasures. Feelings of pleasure and disappointment are part of the feedback mechanism that helps your brain distinguish useful actions from useless ones. 
rewards close the feedback loop and complete the habit cycle. If a behavior is insufficient in any of the four stages, it will not become a habit. Eliminate the cue and your habit will never start. Reduce the craving and you won't experience enough motivation to act. Make the behavior difficult and you won't be able to do it. And if the reward fails to satisfy your desire, then you'll have no reason to do it again in the future. Without the first three steps, a behavior will not occur. Without all four, a behavior will not be repeated. The habit loop. And here we have a figure. I'll just read the figure caption and of course I will put it on the video for you all to see. It says the four stages of habit are best described as a feedback loop. They form an endless cycle that is running every moment you are alive. This habit loop is continuously scanning the environment, predicting what will happen next, trying out different responses and learning from the results. In summary, the cue triggers a craving, which motivates a response, which provides a reward, which satisfies the craving and ultimately becomes associated with the cue. Together, these four steps form a neurological feedback loop, cue, craving, response, reward, cue, craving, response, reward, that ultimately allows you to create automatic habits. This cycle is known as the habit loop. This four step process is not something that happens occasionally, but rather it is an endless feedback loop that is running and active during every moment you are alive, even right now. The brain is continually scanning the environment, predicting what will happen next, trying out different responses, and learning from the results. The entire process is completed in a split second, and we use it again and again without realizing everything that has been packed into the previous moment. We can split these four steps into two phases, the problem phase and the solution phase. The problem phase includes the cue and the craving, and it is when you realize that something needs to change. The solution phase includes the response and the reward, and it is when you take action and achieve the change you desire. And here we have a little bit of a figure, the problem phase including the cue and the craving, and the solution phase including the response and the reward. All behavior is driven by the desire to solve a problem. Sometimes the problem is that you notice something good and you want to obtain it. Sometimes the problem is that you are experiencing pain and you want to relieve it. Either way, the purpose of every habit is to solve the problems you face. In the table on the following page, you can see a few examples of what this looks like in real life. Imagine walking into a dark room and flipping on the light switch. You have performed this simple habit so many times that it occurs without thinking. You proceed through all four stages in the fraction of a second. The urge to act strikes you without thinking. Now we are looking at different figures here, which include the problem and solution phases, all of which I will put on the video for us to look at together. Instead of me reading it here, which I think will be a little bit harder for you to digest. By the time we become adults, we rarely notice the habits that are running our lives. Most of us never give a second thought to the fact that we tie the same shoe first each morning or unplug the toaster after each use or always change into comfortable clothes after getting home from work. After decades of mental programming, we automatically slip into these patterns of thinking and acting. The four laws of behavior change. In the following chapters, we will see time and time again how the four stages of cue, craving, response, and reward influence nearly everything we do each day. But before we do that, we need to transform these four steps into a practical framework that we can use to design good habits and eliminate bad ones. I refer to this framework as the four laws of behavior change, and it provides a simple set of rules for creating good habits and breaking bad ones. You can think of each law as a lever that influences human behavior. When the layers are in the right positions, creating good habits is effortless. When they're in the wrong positions, it is nearly impossible. Again, we're presented with another figure here of how to create a good habit, which I will put. Actually, there's two figures here, one of them of how to create a good habit and also how to break a bad habit. So pretty cool stuff. I like that both sides of the coin are presented because just as important as it is to know how to create a good habit, it's just as important as to know how to break a bad habit. It would be irresponsible for me to claim that these four laws are an exhaustive framework for changing any human behavior, but I think they're close. As you will soon see, the four laws of behavior change apply to nearly every field, from sports to politics, art to medicine, comedy to management. These laws can be used no matter what challenge you are facing. There is no need for completely different strategies for each habit. Whenever you want to change your behavior, you can simply ask yourself, one, how can I make it obvious? 
Two, how can I make it attractive? Three, how can I make it easy? And four, how can I make it satisfying? If you have ever wondered, why don't I do what I say I'm going to do? Why don't I lose the weight or stop smoking or save for retirement or start that side business? Why do I say something is important but never seem to make time for it? The answers to those questions can be found somewhere in these four laws. The key to creating good habits and breaking bad ones is to understand these fundamental laws and how to alter them to your specifications. Every goal is doomed to fail if it goes against the grain of human nature. Your habits are shaped by the systems in your life. In the chapters that follow, we will discuss these laws one by one and show you how you can use them to create a system in which good habits emerge naturally and bad habits wither away. Okay, so we've learned a lot in this chapter. It's another good reading for today, and I hope that everyone was able to internalize a little bit of that and make some action, you know, have some action items that you can take away from having listened to chapter three. And again, continue improving your life. Now we have a little bit of a framework for how we can create good habits. And I really like that it's presented in four seemingly simple steps, right? I have heard a term before or a phrase that goes something like, you know, it's, it's simple but hard. I believe it's something like that. How, how for example, you know, how, how do I get clean your teeth? You know, like the act of brushing your teeth is a simple thing, but being consistent with it and creating a framework and a system for it is the hard part, right? So, you know, getting big and fit and athletic is pretty simple. All you have to do is go to the gym, but the actual act of going to the gym and going with enough intensity and consistency is really the hard part. Nice, so we've been making pretty good progress. We have read three chapters of this book so far. I'm not really sure how many there are, but we will attempt to go through the entire book. Now let's talk about my day today, pretty normal day. Really the main thing I wanna talk about is the workout I did today. As you know, I'm back to doing three days a week, three body, three full body workouts for the entire week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And we can go over the exercises I did today. So I started off with a Smith machine bench press. So five sets of five reps. I had two warm up sets beforehand. So I did a warm up set of 10 reps with 25 pounds, another warm up set of 10 reps with 35 pounds. And then I started doing my working sets. So I did one working set with 45 pounds, another one with 50. So adding five pounds on each side. And then another one of 55, so 10 pounds on each side. At this point, I became pretty exhausted. And so I stopped and I moved on to the machine pack deck. On the machine pack deck, frankly, I only did one of the three sets of 12 reps. I just really wasn't feeling it. I felt like at that point, I had gone hard enough on the bench press that the pack deck, you know, I wanted to save my energy to complete the rest of the workout. And that's why I actually didn't even finish machine pack deck. So we can just go right over that one. I then went to leg extension, which I had an awesome set. So I did two warm-up sets, I believe, one with 30 pounds and one with 50 pounds. And then I started my working sets. I did 10 of 50, 10 of 70, 10 of 90. And on 110, I think I did maybe three reps of 110. And then I started doing a drop set until I finally got to 10 reps. Leg curls also went very well. I did three out of the four sets here, but I went heavier than I typically do. To be honest, my legs are still a little bit fried from the front squats and squatting I did on Monday. So I feel pretty good. I feel like I still went hard. And on hamstring curls, I did 50, 65, and then 80. So that was really nice. Strong. I know I'm definitely getting stronger. I did a set of neutral grip pull-ups and then also a set of regular chin-ups, only two out of the four. I'm not yet at the point where I can successfully do four sets of pull-ups. Pull-ups are extremely difficult. Unlike doing pull-downs, you know, you're literally pulling your entire body up to the bar. So it's much harder than pulling something down to your body. So that will be the day, you know, the same way that I felt about being able to do all of my bicep curl sets using 30 pounds. One day, if I can do four sets of 10 reps of body weight pull-ups, I will feel very good. Then going on to seated lateral raises, I did three out of the four sets here, going heavier than I normally do. So that felt really good, very excited about that. Huh. 
finally ended up doing some dumbbell hammer curls, which was pretty cool. Normally I like to do, what is it called, supinated dumbbell curls. I think it's called supinated dumbbell curls, so that's the ones that I did on Monday. I was able to do it with the 30 pounds. Hammer curls are a little bit more difficult. You're working a lot of your forearm. So I did 25 pounds, then I did a couple of 30 pounds, then I went back down to 25 and then back to 20, but still felt a really nice pump and a really nice burn. So very happy for that. Rope extensions, I, I actually didn't do any tricep work. But actually, I, I, did a, I did a machine for tricep extensions, but you know, I, I, I was pretty fried by this point, and I'm sure that my triceps got good enough work on the bench, you know, a nice compound movement. And so I wasn't re really too concerned about doing triceps, but I will say so far in the short amount of time that I've done this program, I have seen more gains than when I used to go every single day because going every single day, I just don't have enough time to recover. So, you know, if you're thinking about starting a new gym workout and, you know, you feel like you need to go every single day, that's certainly not the case. And I've, I've heard time and time and again, it just took me forever to really believe it that for most people, if you go three days of the week with good intensity, you will definitely see gains. Now, there's two things I wanna talk about that I feel like now, so let me backtrack a little bit. I have, have been on this quest forever to lose body weight or body fat, you know? I have a little bit of stubborn belly fat that I've just wanted to get rid of. I've always wanted to like really lean out and be skinny, you know, not scrawny, but just have low body fat percentage, right? To be vascular and, you know, just have a flat stomach. I've always wanted that look and it's extremely difficult to get because, well, again, it's one of those things that's simple, but hard, right? Simple in the fact that you just have to cut down calories, but I'm sort of doing, if you're all familiar with this fitness influencer called Greg Doucette, I wouldn't say main gaining, but I'm not going on a drastic cut. I think really the main thing that has helped me out was typically I was pretty good in the morning for breakfast, having a couple eggs, maybe a slice of turkey bacon, you know, coffee, that was all good. I think where I normally messed up was my lunch because lunch at work, while delicious, was just full. I mean, you know, I would sometimes have a big old plate of chicken parmesan with, you know, spaghetti full of oil and a big old piece of chicken breast, breaded chicken breast with sauce and cheese. And then on top of that, I'd have a salad and bread. So it was a great meal, but I, you know, I don't think that if I want to get six pack or, you know, just reduce my body fat a little bit, that's something I should be eating every day. So what I did instead was I opted in for the healthier option that they have, which to be honest is not really fun. I don't think it tastes bad, but it's essentially a serving of brown rice with grilled chicken breast, an avocado, not even a full avocado, half an avocado, and then a salad. So it is healthy. You get a lot of your nutritional profile from that meal, which I love. And I think already in the, you know, I've only been eating this for maybe four days now, but it, it has been the thing that has really impacted my weight the most. So I already feel lighter, I feel better. So I'm very excited to continue doing that. But now I've, I'm reaching a point where, okay, you know, I'm working out hard, I'm eating less, but I do need to start increasing the amount of calories just by a little bit. I'm definitely not into doing a dirty bulk. You know, I'm 30 years old. I don't wanna be scarfing down like burritos from Taco Bell or double cheeseburgers. You know, if I was 21 or 22, perhaps, I guess. But at my age, I want to slowly increase the calories that I'm consuming to still say, you know, to stay in a healthy caloric surplus so I can feel my muscle gains and just overall feeling, like just feeling good. So here's an example of what I had this morning. This morning I had three scrambled eggs with a slice of turkey bacon and also a bagel with cream cheese. Tomorrow I'm probably gonna do the same thing, but I'm probably gonna have two slices of turkey bacon, right? So now I'll get a couple more calories from that, a little bit more protein, which is gonna be great. For lunch, probably still stick with the same thing, but what I'm also gonna do is I have this little bag of granola at home one of those like protein granolas and there's Greek yogurt in my office. So I'm going to take some of that granola and just have it as like a mid morning snack right before lunch to give me an extra, I think that Greek yogurt has like 110 cal calories and 12 grams of protein. You know, add a little bit of that granola in there to get some more protein, some more calories. So slowly, little by little increasing my calorie count 
Again, I, you know, I don't, I just barely want to increase my caloric intake every week, literally by 100 or 200 calories a day. Nothing too crazy. I, I don't want to get fat. That's not the goal, you know? I 100% 100 respect people that are able to just do the bulk full force, but you know, you don't typically see that with older people. And I'm not saying that I'm old, I'm just saying that I'm not 21. And at my age, you know, I just don't, I wanna, I wanna try and look good year round. And the way to do that is frankly just by, again, slowly increasing caloric surplus, continuing to work out with high intensity, doing these walks, which will help me even eat more as I'm burning calories, and it'll all just it'll all just be good. So checking my watch here. It looks like we're just about to hit our goal. I'll probably just finish off doing this little loop here and then we'll continue. Rather not continue, but we'll be complete. And let me give you a little bit more, I guess, context about the coming days. So it's gonna mostly be, well not mostly, it is gonna be normal up until next Friday. So I've been saying it, you know, for a couple days already, but next Friday I will be starting my vacation. So Friday I probably will not, I, like I said already, I'm not going to be uploading anything probably from the 15th until the 25th. On the 26th when I come back, I will probably have videos for, let me see, not the 15th or the 16th, nor I believe the 17th, but I do believe on the 18th and perhaps the 20th and the 21st. I'll have videos. So when I come back, you know, it'll be 10 days off. When I come back, I'll probably have five videos to upload, you know, because some days I'm just not going to be able to record and I don't want to, you know, go too much out of my way to make a video because I, I just want to enjoy my time with my family, my girlfriend, her family. And that's really what the holidays are all about. You know, I'll have plenty of time in the new year in subsequent months to continue going hard and making as many videos as I can. I have a couple of ideas for videos. So, you know, I have, I have statistics from, so I started this channel on November 5th, but unfortunately I didn't start tracking my walks until the 13th. So I was thinking after I have 30 days of walking, I would like to make a video where I just discuss how, you know, how my life has improved how many calories I've lost, how many miles I've lost, averages for all the different totals, and just sort of a summary so that newcomers to the channel can see what they can achieve in a short amount of time. And like I said, at the end of the year, when the challenge is done, it would be really cool if some of the people from the Discord maybe sent in like a five or 10 second little video of them saying, you know, if they enjoy the challenge or how many calories they lost or what big changes in their life happens because they joined the challenge. And I think it'll be cool just to give different people shout outs and just to highlight that on the channel. I'm very much for promoting the people because the people are what make the challenge and the channel. And without you all, I really wouldn't be having any fun doing what I'm doing. I mean, I would still enjoy it for myself, but doing it with a community is much, much better. Okay, so at the beginning, I said that I needed to do Let's see, 1.77, let's see how we are, 1.79. So we have officially crossed the threshold of the amount of mileage we need for today. This will put us over that 3.23 miles needed to accomplish our goals. And on the weekend, I will be filming on Sunday. I will be doing another walk at a park, a park that I really do enjoy. This park is awesome because they're, they're close to the beach. They're close to the intercoastal. They have a lot of activities in there like kayaking and bike riding. They have nighttime kayaking and they have some really cool trails. They also have an awesome restaurant that it is pricey, but I mean, for where you are in South Florida to be able to just drink and have a snack in front of the beach is awesome. It's very dog friendly as well. So oftentimes I go, I see a ton of dogs and it's just a, it's a really nice way to spend a classic Florida early afternoon to late afternoon. So I will be doing that on Sunday early in the morning. I have a lot to do this weekend as I prepare for my upcoming PTO. It's been a long time coming. 
I, I am the type of person that keeps countdowns for my vacation. So I started counting down on June 19th. And I remember June 19th because that's the last time I went on a big vacation, I believe. Or maybe it was October. I'm not sure. But June 19th, I went on a vacation. And I decided we're going to start counting from now. And I think the number on the board was like 170 something. And every day I would reduce that number by one. I would physically go to my whiteboard, drop the number by one, and that's how I would do my countdown. And just today, we're now in the single digits. So it's very cool going from triple digits to double digits to now single digits. You can only imagine how fun it is to finally almost be at the point of vacation to disconnect and just have a great time. So we're approaching the end of our walk. I'm going to finish the workout. 1.9 miles, 35 minutes and 37 seconds with an average pace of 18 minutes and 46 seconds per mile, 196 calories and an average heart rate of 99 beats per minute. I wanna thank everyone for joining me on this walk today. I hope you all enjoyed the reading from Atomic Habits. I've also, or rather I also hope that you just enjoy walking. And shout out to everyone in the Discord. Thanks for being active and sharing your walks and images and it feels very, very awesome and just gratifying to see the collaboration among everyone. And like always, take care and happy holidays.